right, good morning and welcome to uh, this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, as we are doing right now, and then it is posted to our website for you to watch at your convenience, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. Both the live show and the recorded recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think may be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. For those of you uh, not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries here, um, similar to your state library for, potentially. Um, so we provide services, training, consulting, et cetera, to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find things on our show that are for public libraries, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, uh, et cetera, et cetera, really anything and anything that is um, libraries. Uh, really our only criteria for the show is that it's something to do with libraries, something libraries are doing, uh, something we think they could be doing. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come in sometimes to do presentations about things, uh, products and services and things we offer here through the Library Commission. Uh, we also bring in guest speakers from across the state and across the country to talk about things, uh, cool things they're doing in their libraries. But before we get into today's show, I am just briefly going to pop over to our Library Commission homepage here and we uh, and talk about some resources we have here. Uh, we are all right now still in the deep in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic and it is um, going strong and uh, getting worse as time is going on. And we have resources on our Library Commission website for our libraries to help them navigate the current situation. There is a link here. This, this first post here at the top of our um, blog is pinned, so it'll always appear there at the top of our page um, no matter every time you come here, um, as a link to resources that we've put together for our libraries. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have a link here to where we're trying to keep track of mostly our public libraries, but some of our academics are in there too, of who's open, and who's closed, um, special accommodations, uh, you know, Wi-Fi extending to the parking lot, curbside pickup, whatever, um, who has now reclosed. That is now happening with many of our libraries, as I'm sure it's happening, I know it's happening all across the country. Uh, new uh, outbreaks have flared up and libraries who had opened are now having to close again. So we're trying to keep track of that here. If you're a Nebraska library, let our reference staff know and we'll keep that up to date as well as we can, but I just wanna show you here on our pandemic resources page, we have a link with a form, libraries can tell us what they're doing, we have some maps, but there's a sub page here which has some great resources that you can use um, to help your patrons. And this is not just for Nebraska libraries, though it says for Nebraskans, um, many of these resources are just out there for anybody, um, so just pay attention when you're looking at it, if it is something that says in Nebraska, this is how it works, or other things that are more general. So homeschooling my kids, what do I do for financial help? Um, how do I keep my kids entertained and fun? Um, but our second link right here, but about my library, this is specifically resources for libraries, for you running your library. Um, closing, reopening, um, information from the CDC, World Health Organization, ALA, um, OCLC, IMLS, et cetera, et cetera, anything, anybody that has any resources. We're always adding to this, so keep an eye on here if there's new links, new deadlines for things new um, webinars or information that's posted with information for school libraries. Uh, here in Nebraska, specific information about having to have an open meeting. So this is Nebraska specific and just lots of other resources here. So um, please do keep an eye on us if you're in Nebraska library, check our page for any resources. Um, anything here that's general, it's good for anybody to look at. Um, but check in with your, you know, if you're not in Nebraska, check in with your state library or your state library association and see if they have any resources that they may be um, sharing out there as well. So let's get into today's show now. I am going to find my right screen here. Tim, I'm going to make you presenter so we can get your slides up. Okay. You should see that option now. Let's see here. Yep. Let's see. What's that look like? There you go. Yep. I see your slides and they're full screen. Awesome. 
All right, so this morning with us, we have Tim Lentz, who is, well, he wears multiple hats. Uh, <laughs> uh, today, he's speaking mainly as the chair of our Nebraska Library Association's Diversity Committee um, to talk about to us about how we can read more diversely ourselves. So I'm just gonna uh, hand over to you to uh, tell us all about how to do that, Tim, no pressure. Sounds good, Krista, thank you so much. Um, gosh, it's I've mentioned this before, but it's just always a pleasure to, um, be here and to work with you. It's uh, comfortable and this is uh, a really important topic. Um, 2020 obviously has been a year in uh, a lot of different ways mm -hmm. and uh, some of that has impacted diversity. So I wanted to talk about that. I want to do a couple of things, just kind of talking about my own bona fides. Uh, it, it sometimes feels a little bit awkward to be a uh, white cishet male who is representing the diversity committee, but I had conversations with actually the past chair of the diversity committee who pointed out that it is on people who are sort of already quote unquote in the mainstream to shoulder some of the load. It is um, some, some Latinx people have talked to me specifically about the importance of being a good ally, the importance of doing the work alongside folks not saying that diverse issues are only for diverse populations, but the diverse issues are for all of us. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to mention that just to let you know where I'm coming from. Uh, as things happened, uh, no other committee members uh, are able to attend. So I am flying solo on this one, but uh, we've got a good committee. We've got some non-binary folks on our committee. We've got some folks with various ethnic diversity backgrounds on our committee. Um, it's it is a diverse committee and uh i just happen to be the uh, solo face of it this morning and that's something we were talking about before we started too about how and people may um think stereotypically that nebraska is all very monochromatic <laughs> in very ways and it and our nebraska library association our people are not it's not real that like that at all Yes, <clears throat> I think that's really important because I think there is that perception there and that perception is not accurate. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've seen is we're absolutely driving toward um, being part of those issues, addressing those issues, broadening our own outreach in a lot of different ways. And I will talk about that through the course of the um, presentation. The other piece that I want to mention, most of this is, again, just coming from, you know, things I have read. So there's a lot of stuff that's out there that I'm not going to mention because I'm I'm not going to talk about it. Because it's reading diversity or reading diversely, it's going to be things that I am familiar with that I have gone back and read or have read for the first time this year. One of the other pieces that I think is kind of um, a contextual piece uh, is... Um, this is something that is absolutely happening in Nebraska. Uh, oh, yeah. Point is this year right here, talking about Black Lives Matter, talking about Solidarity Saturdays, talking about LGBTQ plus issues, talking about disability issues. All of these matter to Nebraska. All of these matter to librarians. All of these matter to librarians and libraries right here in Nebraska. The next point that I'll move on to after that is our book clubs enough. And uh, spoiler alert, the answer is no, but they are a great place to start. Mm -hmm. On that, there have been a wave of books that have been very popular this year. It's also very important to go back to know the history, to find the roots, to get some of the context. Mm -hmm. Then once you've got that, it's also really important to be meeting diverse audiences where they are. We can work to make sure that our collections are ready for all of the people in our public. If you think of us, you know, currently I work in a public library. If you think of us as serving the public, that same dichotomy that we talked about where we tend to think of Nebraska as a monochromatic state, again, is simply not true. And we can, we can do that work out of the gate to make sure that our collections are not quote unquote monochromatic. The last thing that I want to talk about, again, not in great detail, but I think it's one of the most important things to look at right now, is how we move beyond just reading diversity, reading diversely, how librarians and libraries can 
uh, address the issues in turbulent times. So one of the things that I kind of wanted to start with, just setting the relevance and um, pertinence of this topic for, for libraries in general, and certainly in Nebraska, Black Lives Matter, Solidarity Saturdays with meatpacking plant workers in COVID um, pandemic times, LGBTQ issues across the state and in libraries and disability issues. All of these matter. All of these are different uh, axes of diversity, if you will. This is a photograph uh, from, I believe, um, a uh, from Bold Nebraska, which is an activist group in the state of Nebraska. Um, this is on Juneteenth. Juneteenth, of course, is uh, a time where they commemorate that word actually came down in Texas that the slaves had been freed. Right in the middle of that in Nebraska, there were Black Lives Matter protests. Those actually happened across the state. Uh, the library I'm working at in Hastings, we saw little gatherings even here in Hastings. We saw gatherings in Grand Island. There were large gatherings, <clears throat> um, you know, even some, dare I say it, unrest in places like Lincoln and Omaha in, in oh, this. Yeah. And it's, it's right here. Um, there was an African-American man who was shot and killed uh, in Omaha and all of a sudden, you know, quote unquote, little old Omaha, quote unquote, little old Nebraska became part of a national conversation along with other issues around Black Lives Matter. So this is something that does impact all of us. It's something that does impact the state of Nebraska and Omaha. So uh, this is a picture I really like. This is my friend Gladys Godinez. Uh, Gladys is an organizer out in Lexington, Nebraska. Uh, she was, I believe, born in Guatemala. Her roots are certainly there. And one of the things that happened even before uh, even before the recent wave of Black Lives Matter uh, protests and marches and things like that emerged, there were already car rallies that were going on starting, I believe, in March and certainly in April uh, in solidarity with meatpacking plant workers. That is a predominantly Latino workforce. It is a predominantly immigrant and minoritized workforce. And they were seeing outbreaks of COVID happen in meatpacking plants across the entire state of Nebraska. And the reason for that is you work side by side in those plants. It was very difficult until they started taking precautions to stop the spread. You saw Lexington, you saw Grand Island, you saw Sioux City, um, you saw Crete, you saw a number of these plants sort of be the source of hot spots of outbreaks very early on and we needed to mobilize and protest. Um, we got up and protested with some car rallies in Grand Island personally, and it was, you know, it was work and it was challenging. We would have people who would really come out and cheer for us, and we have, would have people who clearly did not care for what we had to say. It was, um, I think, disruptive to some people's perceptions. Um, but Solidarity Saturdays were really important. Those rolled right into Black Lives Matter. There was a protest that I got to participate up in in Grand Island. Uh, we had Black Lives Matter representatives there. We had Solidarity Saturdays representatives there. We had the PFLAG chapter in Grand Island there. There were groups that just came together in this. And that's something that's really, really important. We need to be reaching out. We need to be looking at how diverse communities pull together to address these issues. And we need to remember that it happens right here in Nebraska. Uh, this is one of my old favorite spaces. Um, it is closed now. Uh, this is the Panic Bar in Lincoln, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. It's one of the LGBTQ, uh, more of a lesbian bar than a gay bar, but very, very affirming and welcoming. Um, I mentioned this because we are seeing with COVID lots of spaces of one kind and another are closing. Um, we have seen right in my public library, uh, people are trying to figure out how they're going to fax things. People are going to try to figure out how they're going to get things printed. And we, you mentioned libraries closing again. We are closing again. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we'll do with it, but we're trying to find options to still make some of our 
fax services, our print services, our copy services. We're, <clears throat> we're trying to see if we can make those available to the public um, because those things are going away. The other thing that's happening is space is going away. Some of these places that were space for diverse communities of one kind and another, um, they're not safe to be in, businesses are just closing up, things are happening, and hopefully many of those businesses will come back. But until they do, libraries and librarians may need to remember that we have always been space as well as collections of books, and we may need to be a space for groups that don't have a space right now. Mm -hmm. um, that is that is something that I think we need to think about. The other piece that I want to mention, um, I don't have a slide for it, but I do want to talk about it, is disability issues. Um, you know, that's twofold. One thing that is happening is we are closed. We consistently had uh, groups with disabilities who came into our library. We've had to be creative about reaching out to them. We can't can't be a space for them right now. And again, to remember that this impact is right here in Nebraska, uh, there was a lawsuit over the summer from disability groups when they were rolling out testing for COVID that they were not looking at how do disabled folks get to those test sites. Yeah. Uh, a couple that was that was blind and they don't drive. And they were like, well, how do we get there? It's not good for us to take an Uber. We probably shouldn't take public transportation in case we're sick. And we need to stay cognizant of all the people in our communities, you know, as librarians and as Nebraskans. Um, all of that is just to say it is right here. It does matter. There are disabled librarians in Nebraska. There are uh, folks with various diverse backgrounds working in libraries in Nebraska. We are serving all of those people. All of this really does matter. We are absolutely not a monochromatic state, and we are absolutely not monochromatic libraries, and we need to be working to serve all of the populations that use our libraries, whether that's public libraries, academic libraries, or special libraries of whatever kind. So one of the things uh, that happened over the summer uh, is a lot of us joined book clubs and, and I joined some book clubs. I'm gonna talk about some of the books that I read in my book club. But there was, <clears throat> There was an editorial and it was very well written uh, and it was it was provocative when black people are in pain white people just join book clubs and I'm, I'm, I'm going to cop to that you know I am a white person who joined a book club and I'm glad I did uh, and it was it was challenging and valuable <clears throat> but it can't stop there we can't we can't read up on uh, the challenges that diverse audiences face and then just kind of be like, oh, well, I know about that. And then continue doing business as usual. It is really important to be reading up. It is really important to, to frankly be joining the book clubs, but it is not, um, it is not at all enough to- Or expanding what titles you suggest for a book club if you are already in one. Yes, yep. If you are already in a book club, and and I did see some book clubs around here do that. I saw some book clubs that already existed. You know, maybe you know this. There's there's a book club that I'm aware of that they read different genres. So they one month they're doing this genre, one month they're doing another genre, one month they're doing another genre. And if I remember correctly, um, over the summer they just kind of set their usual rotation aside. And, and started reading some books about Black Lives Matter issues, about related issues, uh, about things like this. Because, you know, two things happened and those things interact. But one thing is obviously the pandemic, and that has huge impacts for diverse communities and diverse reading. The other thing that happened, of course, is, is a wave of killing of African-American people um, frequently by, by law enforcement. Um, 
that's not an indictment of law enforcement per se, uh, nor of individual officers who are out there, but it highlights a societal problem. Mm -hmm. And talk about that in society terms. We don't have to break it down into this side and that side, but we do have to address these issues that are that are coming to us. And there are some great um, reading lists that were put out. I'm not sure you might be may mention some too that were put out of like anti-racism, anti-racist uh, racism. Yep readings and whatnot. I mean, there's lots of resources out there for it. Um, but it's interesting that you mentioned that book club that does a different genre every every month um, or every time. Um, that, I mean, we're talking about some serious things right now because of the situation in our country, but that's a reading diversely as well, rather than you know, just sticking to what you like, <laughs> you know, and what you're comfortable with reading. Read something that someone else suggested that you would have never thought about even looking at before because it's what the group's doing. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a reading diversely as well yeah it, it really is and it gets you in that mental habit of then breaking down your own silos like i love science fiction yes and i have a friend who is challenging me to read romance novels and mm -hmm. so i'm talking to her and i'm like jennifer where do i start and she's like let's talk about this and this and that keeps in the habit of exploring of moving beyond you're more comfortable trying something else new because yes yeah. yes yep. i did that i'm i've mainly my whole life been a fantasy sci-fi reader as well and mm -hmm. i got into cozy mysteries you might talk yes, say yes. because there is some that have and it's kind of you know you sneak in on things that make it easy for you that have librarians as the key people in it mm-hmm Aha, that's me. I can probably work with that. <laughs> yep. Now, the flip side of it, again, as a sci-fi and fantasy fan, one of the things I've been doing, another avenue to diversify my own reading, is I've been trying to read a lot of uh, diverse sci-fi. And I will tell you, as a sci-fi fan, oh, yeah. things going on right now, I, yeah. I honestly suspect we're going to look back in probably like 10, 15 years and we're going to talk about this time as another golden age of science fiction. And that is going to be largely driven by diverse authors of science fiction. Within and, genres of what you've always stereotypically thought of what they would be, they're becoming more just within that genre, you know, of what you think yes. sci-fi is, it's becoming more diverse within itself because of who's writing and what's going on and what they want to write about because of what's happening in the world. It all kind yep. of... <laughs> So uh, speaking, kind of circling back to book clubs, this is the one that my book club read. Uh, this one, this one challenged me. Um, I'll be honest, it was not my favorite. I think it's very, very good. And there were folks in the book club who loved it and really appreciated it. Uh, that, that last line there about becoming a good ancestor, that was part of this book that really did resonate with me deeply. We need to think about what we're doing, not only for ourselves, but what we're modeling for young folks who come into our libraries, what we're modeling for the folks around us who see what we're doing, uh, what we are passing on, frankly, generation to generation. Absolutely. Uh, one of the other things I really did like about this book is it's structured as a workbook. We dug mm -hmm. in and we we worked on it over a course of weeks where we would read we would work we would meet and it pulls some things apart for you um she is not um she's not from the united states so some of her perspectives kind of flattened um diversity in the united states a little bit um one of the things that i've noticed um my, my own wife was born in Mexico. Mm -hmm. so, you know, sometimes we take a step beyond the quote unquote monochromatic view of the world around us to, again, a, a frankly black and white view of the world around us. Um, that can sometimes leave out folks, uh, you know, from various Asian backgrounds, folks from various uh, Latinx backgrounds, um, folks from all different parts of the world. And we can tend to think of things only along an axis of black and white. Um, 
the critiques, the thought provoking, all of that was very, very useful. And I think I, I think I was able to grow beyond it. Um, but also, I think you need to read enough of these books to begin to be well versed in what all is out there and to say, hey, I really like this for this thing. I really like that for that thing. You know, I would just without hesitation recommend this book to certain folks. I'd like to have it in my sort of stable. If somebody comes in, I would say, what are you looking for? Where are you at with this? And this would be one that I would really go to. Um, for me personally, something that covered a lot of the same material that resonated more with me uh, was So You Want to Talk About Race by E.J. Oma Oluo. Um, she has direct African heritage, uh, but lives here in the United States. And um, whew, this book took me apart. Um, it made me think about my presuppositions. It made me think about how to talk about race. Uh, the other thing that I really liked was there are consistent, concrete, um, I, I don't want to simplify it as useful tips, but it's, uh, concrete takeaways. Hey, next time you're in a situation, do this. Um, mm -hmm. Don't don't talk about, uh, you know, my African American friend, my disabled friend, my Latinx friend, and think that that gets you off the hook. Think about how to how to come ready, how to be doing the work yourself so that you're not always calling up your minoritized friend and making them responsible for your education i think that i like that of having something concrete to do because i mean like you said you know having these kind of books in your book club and reading them is the first step and that's great and you can read all these stories and um these books that talk about it but then okay i know i should do something else but what is that something else mm -hmm. how do i find out what i should you know actually do now about it i've read this i've learned it i get it now what and having something that actually says do the, here's what you need to remember when you're in this situation or here's what you how you should respond when something happens that i think that's the part that but like that editorial in the washington post said a lot of people are missing they're not mm -hmm. taking that extra and sometimes they just aren't because it's hard it is it's a hard thing to do to change how you've been um acting if you if you're not sure how you've been acting um but it's also just i need someone to tell me <laughs> just tell me what how i can do it and i'll do it just put it in writing somewhere so i can have this as like a guide <laughs> yes well and that is so much of it like please point me in the right direction but then also maybe give me a first step or two you know mm -hmm. and and she talks about that she says when you show up in spaces that are not yours sit back and listen okay. that's that i think is important for all of us again being a white cishet male on that's a good that's a good video. comment for anything in life honestly <laughs> not even just uh you know race or whatever it's just anywhere you are if you're new to it learn about it before you jump in and try and make changes or tell these people here's how things should be i think you're doing it all wrong and here's what i think from my experience elsewhere I'm like, well that's nice elsewhere but learn about us first take some time and then you have more you can you can say something with that knowledge that you've come from what how things are here because it's not going to be the same as where you wherever you came from before and that i think that's just a good life thing to say to stick with <laughs> yeah well and to not roll in and like hey i i see the solution well you know what i will almost guarantee you that solution that you just came up with has already been considered. Mm -hmm. Was like and, and it's not it's not this flip of a switch. You know, you come into a new group and you're like, well, hey, let's just, you know, do this. And they're like, yeah, that's what we've been working on. You know, um, that's that's where we're coming from. And that I'll kind of move forward to the next section. I want to touch on this one just briefly before moving on. The thing that I liked about this, um, the the original was written by Ibram X. Kendi. Uh, it was called um, Stamped, I forget the exact title, but like Stamped on the Body, 
Jason Reynolds is a writer for younger folks. Mm -hmm. And so the content is still uh, Ibram X. Kendi's content, but Jason Reynolds put it in a context that is really geared at like, um, you know, teens, young adults, things like that. And that's something to be mindful of too. It's, it's good for us to be educating ourselves, but we also need to be providing resources so that folks of any age can be educating ourselves. And so this was another one that I read that I really did like a lot. And it's one that I would like to put in the hands of young folks when they're um, working on these kinds of things. So like we were saying, um, these are not new problems. You can't roll in here and just fix them overnight. Um, one of the things that, that I did this year that I wanna kind of move through and highlight and encourage everyone to do is to dig deeper, look back at the roots. There have been folks writing about these things for, frankly, centuries. Um, you know, if you go back and look at W.E.B. Du Bois, um, if you look at Franz Fanon, if you look at folks, like this is not, this is not something that we woke up with in 2020 that happened. Um, there were some things that flared up, but it's not, it's not new. And again, knowing your history helps you come into those spaces a little bit more, uh, I think, carefully, and I think uh, with some humility. Um, this is one I went back and read this year, uh, Teaching to Transgress by Bell Hooks. Um, it's, it, she's an African-American writer. Uh, it is um, explicitly feminist. It is explicitly uh, critical in how it teaches. Uh, I read this first a long time ago, back taking education classes in college. Um, I did not become a teacher. I became a librarian instead, which I do think is its own kind of being a teacher. But this was one that has just given me a lasting framework that I went back and revisited. Um, it talks about some things, and if I have any, I, I know I have at least one college librarian in the audience. It talks about constructing knowledge. It talks about knowledge as something that we participate in, which um, sounds an awful lot like the ACRL framework about knowledge being constructed, about authority being constructed, uh, about things being a framework. And so this was something that, that I read early on and then just in the past three, four years when the um, latest ACRL frameworks came out, I was like, oh, I feel like I recognize some of that. So getting that history is really, really useful. Um, this is one that a lot of folks really ought to read. Everybody has this framework of Malcolm X as uh, sort of the radical uh, militant counterpart to Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And I recommend anybody in this audience to go back and read this. He was on a journey through his entire life. Uh, he spoke out, he stood up, and as you follow, you see that it was sort of an act of survival uh, to, to be as outspoken as he was. You also see that he himself, after reforming from being a criminal in his early years, was never personally involved in violence. Uh, he was assassinated at the end, but Malcolm X was somebody who really... He, he threads in and out of things that Martin Luther King was, was writing about, and he's often set up in opposition with Martin Luther King, and I think that's, I think that's a deep oversimplification. The other reason I like to mention him, uh, folks may not remember this, but he was born in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, he's probably one of the more famous people who was born in Omaha, so again, that keeps that connection. That helps us remember these are things that matter around here. These are things that start here and move forward from, from our part of the world. Um, the other one, let me see here, did I? Yeah, uh, this one I just started reading, Martin Luther King Jr. I wanted to go back after reading Malcolm. I was like, I should read Martin again. Yeah, and you, you, I want to get both, all, all sides of something, of a yeah. situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and finding both parts of those conversations, both sides of it, 
it starts to really deepen the perspective on both. You have more of an idea of Malcolm knowing more about Martin. You have more of an idea about Martin knowing more about Malcolm and seeing that they absolutely were in conversation with each other through their writings throughout the 60s. And, and those conversations uh, are still lasting. Um, so this is not a book per se, but this is something that really hit home. Grab that link, get out there and check this one out. This is fantastic. Before Ernie Chambers had finished law school, before he had become the sometimes firebrand senator that we still know him as, there's this documentary. Uh, He's this so young. <laughs> What's that? He's so young. <laughs> yes, yes, it's it's amazing. I mean, I know he's been in, uh, involved in this forever, but yeah, I just have never seen as many of the older pictures yet. Yeah, this this documentary, I'm going to be honest, it's a little bit heartbreaking. The other man in this photo is William Youngdahl, who is a Lutheran minister, and he is not even trying to integrate his church. He is trying to have a conversation between his church and African-American churches in Omaha. This is from 1966. And Ernie is literally, like in this photo, Ernie is cutting somebody's hair. Um, this was literally when Ernie Chambers was just a barber. And he was already somebody who was outspoken in the community. He hadn't, I don't know if he was in law school, but he had certainly not finished law school. He was not the state senator that we know him as. He was, he was a young man in the community and oh i mean we hear ernie chambers challenge people in uh, the unicameral still and you see all of that in this film this this young white lutheran pastor comes in and he is doing his best and he's clearly he's educated he's a minister and he is doing his best to keep up with ernie and ernie isn't like just beating him up, but he asks these tough questions. And the whole the whole dialogue throughout this film, uh, they meet with a, uh, a youth group from one of the African-American churches. They meet with a youth group from the white church that that pastor is the pastor of. They have those two youth groups sit down together. It's a beautiful film. Part of what's heartbreaking about it is to see that some of the issues we are still working on have been things we have been working on, again, right here in Nebraska, right here in Omaha, uh, for 50 some years. You know, all of the questions that Ernie raises are still so relevant, so mm -hmm. pertinent to, to right now. Unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately. Again, that tells us go back into our history, learn that these are not new questions, learn that we have been talking about them for many years, and remember, remember again that it is right here, you know, yes, this year, but also right here and also historically. The other thing that that I want to highlight, you know, staying mindful of my time is don't be the only one reading diversely this year. Everybody has gotten out, they've gotten in those book clubs, they've gotten that start. Make sure you're taking that next step. One of the things that libraries can do to be taking that next step very effectively is to be making sure that your collection does represent diversity and does provide reading for lots of different groups in your own communities. Um, again, science fiction. This one, I'm gonna tell you, I just, I straight up love this as science fiction. Um, I love this, it is not written as racial commentary, but there's racial commentary in it. Uh, there are LGBTQ issues um, and characters in this story. This is, N.K. Jameson makes diversity look just effortless in this story. I, I loved it because it was a sci-fi novel. Um, all of those issues are there, but she's not preaching to you about them. She's not beating you up with them. And it is a it is a beautiful. I mean, it's it, it's it almost slides out of the bounds of science fiction. It's it's almost like bordering on um, urban fantasy or things like that. And it, 
she's been a favorite of mine for a while. Uh, the thing that thrills me about this is this is first of a trilogy. So I get to sit and wait for the next one to come out and then the final one to come out. And so I have, uh, <laughs> I have like months of anticipation ahead of me waiting for, for the second and third uh, installment in the series. Um, I, I just love this book and I want it on the shelves. I put it in the hands of sci-fi readers. I put it in the hands. Now I have to add it to my Christmas list to send to my family. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now that you've said all of that. <laughs> I, I, I get it to sci-fi folks. I get it to folks from African-American or other diverse backgrounds because it's not, it's New York City. I mean, it's it's this melting pot of character. Um, I, I put it in the hands of folks from um, different backgrounds in terms of LGBTQ issues. It's, I, I love this book. <laughs> I'm going to put it that way. Um, we do have a couple of comments actually, and I'll jump kind of around a little bit. Um, and I'll just say Anika Ramirez, who's the previous chair of the diversity committee for NLA, is on with us actually. And Anika Hi, says, Anika. Um, Yes, her Broken Earth trilogy is a fantastic must read as well. Yes, yes. Broken Earth and um, effortlessly deals with uh, issues of diversity. There are a number of alien races in it. Um, there are, it, it, it's science fiction in the sense that sexuality is treated more fluidly. It's not, again, she's not beating you over the head, teaching you a lesson with her stories. She's just saying, she's I'm writing there. science fiction. Mm -hmm. Science fiction represents a broader set of perspectives than you know, much as I love him, Heinlein, Asimov, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, all of the, all of the guys who looked like me, who were writing science fiction, you know, back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, I, I, I love that. That's a great foundation. Mm -hmm. But I, the things that are happening right now are taking so many more perspectives into account and making amazing, amazing literature with it. And we also have a comment from Allison. I'm going to, let's see here. All right, I've unmuted you from my side, Allison, but you have to unmute yourself. There you go. Okay. Hi, Hi. Tim. Hi, Krista. And I'm waving, even though you can't see me. How weird is that? <laughs> it's what we do now. <laughs> I know. I know. So, um, you know, Tim's comment about diversifying the collections, uh, as, as a cataloger, you know, I see it as we can do more than just diversifying our collections that we, and some of you may be aware of the controversy over, you know, the use of the heading, subject heading, illegal aliens. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's a lot of libraries, um, probably more at the academic level than at the public level that are on their own have gone ahead and changed those headings. And so my larger point is, you know, it's not just enough to feature these kinds of books in our collection or to celebrate um, you know, Native American History Month, which that's very, very important. I'm not saying that's wrong, but we can also do things in our catalogs, like remove those problematic headings, like illegal aliens, and, mm -hmm. and put something in that's much more accurate. It's, um, yeah, I think that's the end of my point. Yeah, and lots of those, uh, those um, cataloging schemes, they're they're changing them as well yeah. from inside too, that you are, there's always announcements from the Dewey Decimal uh, yeah. team about, this is not what you use anymore, we're changing it, here's an update, yeah. you're gonna use this instead. And that's something that then you need to globally go in and update, you know, your your metadata in your catalog too, yeah. to help people to the right thing as well, yeah. Kind of a um, clandestine behind the scenes activism. Yes. <laughs> yes, and there's and some a, Go ahead. And that's a really important point. That is, again, something we can do. You know, we tend to think of, oh, librarians can put these books out and we can have this month and that month and do our collections. And behind the scenes, we don't have to wait for the Library of Congress to catch up. We don't have to no. wait. No. We can start saying, you know what, illegal aliens, like those people are not aliens, they are human beings and they're not illegal. You can't, I mean, the question that's resonated with me for a long time is how is a person illegal? Like you, it, it can't be illegal to be a person. So yeah, um, 
that's a step that you can take right in your own library. Yeah. You can for that. You can do it behind the scenes and um, start start pushing those changes. Yeah. And, and, you know, like you were saying, you don't have to wait to, the, you know, change illegal aliens. Like with Dewey, if you look at the religion um, section, that's like the 200s, it's dominated by Christianity. And yet mm -hmm. Christianity isn't, you know, the religion of everyone. And so there is one university where um, for part of their collection, they did go ahead and and shift their collection around um, so that it was much more inclusive. Um, mm -hmm. Christianity got pushed more into a smaller section of Dewey mm -hmm. and they were able to broaden um, how like Islam was represented. So there, there's other things you can do. You're not just because Dewey says, oh, hey, you should put it here. No, you can do whatever you want locally. And yeah. local cataloging is a thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what I tell people, I used to teach cataloging classes. Um, and mm -hmm. what I still tell people when they ask me for advice is do what's right for your library. Do what's right for your community. You do not have to be bound by what Elsie says or what, you know, Dewey says, because those schemes are based on, you know, white men, white Protestant men from the 19th century. So no offense to anyone. Um, Absolutely. Well, I'm not from the 19th century, so I've got that going. <laughs> well, no, yeah, that's right. Although your kids might say otherwise, you know, in a few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 yeah. So those I are just an article that I just shared into the chat and, and the questions too from um, American Libraries magazine um, on conscientious cataloging. Yeah. Which is just from this September, September 2020. Um, is a great American Libraries article about changing subject headings. So that might be something to look at. And I shared the link into the chat um, for everybody who wants to grab that. And you can probably I just see. Google it, you know, conscientious cataloging American Libraries. Negative. So yeah, and I see that. And I mean, and I could go on forever, but I don't want to take up time if you have other questions or comments or <laughs> that'll be <laughs> there's nice. Just, yeah. There, yeah, there's just there's just a lot with technical services right now, like what to do with um, you know, dead names, um, transgender mm -hmm. people who have changed their name. Um, how do we recognize that in the catalog without a you know, because using the dead name is obviously wrong. So yeah, there's just it, there's it's so it's an interesting time to be a cataloger i think yeah well and it's an interesting time to be a cataloger who is paying attention yeah like you, said, you can just move along with whatever comes down from library of congress you know working with the old dewey subject headings such as yeah. the so on and so forth or you can say look we have to classify things but this is how we're going to classify things here these are the moves we are going to make right here right yeah. now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Allison. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I know. I know. Uh, Tim has a few more uh, slides here with some other titles. So let's see what else you've got to share with us. Yeah. Let me move through this pretty quickly, just staying mindful of time. Uh, Octavia Butler. Um, she is just a, a titan of science fiction in general. Uh, I. I still. I mean she passed away several years ago and it just feels like her stuff is so fresh I, I mentioned this one because it's a graphic novel um it's based on one of her novels but it's in graphic novel form um, <laughs> it has all of the challenging content that her book has so it's not one to casually recommend to young folks but it is really important kindred is also a great challenging work by her um, so think about like that. Think about like, hey, maybe you're not going to sit down and read a whole novel, but let me get you started with this in another format, um, things like that. Um, Astro Girl, this one is just lovely. It's a, it, I read it to my own kids. Um, the, the girl and her father are talking about all this stuff, and she's kind of like play and dress up astronaut. And you get this sense through the story that, oh, maybe she'll grow up to be an astronaut someday. And the kick is, dad says, okay, we've got to go pick up your mom. And they drive to the uh, launch pad, and her mom is just coming back from the space station. Her mother is the astronaut, and it's already there. And I just thought, you know, it's not just like 
it's not just a someday thing. It's so like, this is already here. This is already happening. And, and the modeling and the story, um, my daughter's current kick that I'm totally encouraging is she's like, I'm going to go to the space station someday. Um, and I believe it, you know, and, and things like this keep her moving that way. Yeah. Uh, Mae Jemison, she's one of my favorites. <laughs> yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. This was another one that I really liked a lot. It's um, not a lot of words, but it's uh, partly bilingual. It's Dreamers by Yuyi Morales. And it's, uh, it's her story as an immigrant um, coming to the Bay Area and just kind of getting immersed in that. And, and I love that perspective, the way she tells her own story of finding her way in the United States. And it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful picture book. Again, um, not beating you over the head with lessons, just showing you other perspectives in a really wonderful format. Um, this was one that I read that just kind of uh, blew me away. Um, heterosexuality is a construct. Um, there were not, once upon a time, real strong notions of um, this person is straight and this person is gay and this person is so on and so forth. That's something that's happened really at most in the last 150, 200 years. And it, it kind of broadens your perspective. Um, again, speaking as a cishet male, um, it, it makes me realize that that my identity is itself a construct. And then it, it puts some context into thinking about other identities that are out there around sexual diversity, around gender diversity and things like that. And I think it's really important to make sure your collection reflects issues like that as well. Um, what I wanna talk about, again, I think just moving quickly here, actions for diversity. Um, again, this year, right here, that's kind of my theme for 2020. Know your community. Get out. Be working. If you can, uh, get yourself invited to a PFLAG meeting in your community. Uh, if you can, show up at those Solidarity Saturdays. Uh, show up for the Black Lives Matter marches that are going on around here. Get to know the disabled folks in your community. Um, talk to them. They are going to know better than you what your library needs if you are not part of those communities yourself. Um, again, are book clubs enough? No, they are not enough, but they're at a really important start. That way you are not always asking um, folks with diverse backgrounds, so tell me about this, so tell me about this. Hey, you know, what's the African-American experience on that? Well, you know, somebody's like, man, I'm just one person, like I don't, have the african-american experience on that but if you come in and you're like you know what i read this book um this was really challenging do you have any thoughts on that you're gonna come a little bit more ready when you need to have those kinds of con kinds of conversations the other thing is prepare yourself have a plan but be ready to adapt i would go look up anything you can about stuff that scott bonner has said uh, five years back now, he was in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, mm -hmm. when Brown was shot, when we first saw the rise of the slogan around Black Lives Matter, and he did some pretty nervy and ultimately extremely effective things with his library. Decide whether you're prepared to do that, and if you're not prepared to do that, decide what you are prepared to do, and then be willing to adapt and change when things emerge in the communities around you and recruit in your communities. I wanna briefly tell a story. So my library happens to have a really, really good collection on a lot of different levels for issues around LGBTQ, sex and gender diversity books. Uh, about 15 years ago, there was uh, a page around this library and I just kinda knew the young man in passing. He was a high school student. He went off to college. Um, he graduated, he went to library school. I had the privilege of going to library school with Mr. Jake Rundle. Uh, he came back to this library, was here for a few years, 
and um, as somebody who identifies as gay himself, then took charge of really building a good collection here, moved on to a wonderful job out in Colorado. When I was able to come on at Hastings Public Library, so I have big shoes that I'm still working to fill in some ways, um, but, but he is part of a pipeline and he built a very, very good collection in this library. I have gone out into the community. I have been able to reach out to PFLAG. I have been able to demonstrate that collection. I have reaped the benefits because that pipeline was built right here in our library. Um, I've just- Followed in Jake's footsteps, yes. <laughs> yes, it's, it's been wonderful. I knew Jake once upon a time just out of high school, and wow. now I'm in a situation where I'm following in his footsteps. And we need to do that on a lot of diverse areas. We need to be recruiting folks with disabilities. We need to be recruiting sex and gender diverse people. We need to be recruiting folks from various different ethnic and um, cultural backgrounds into our libraries. We do sometimes look uh, a little bit monochromatic in our profession in this state still, and that will not change overnight. We need to start from the ground. We need to start recruiting those folks, get them in as volunteers, get them in as um, shelvers or pages or whatever you call them, encourage them to go off to library school, have them come back and change your library too. Uh, the last thing, of course, join the diversity committee of the Nebraska Library Association. Uh, Chris and I were talking about this just a little bit before. Currently, it's a committee. It needs to officially stay at sort of a committee size membership, but there is a lot of conversation going on inside and outside of the committee about having something more than that that would allow for greater numbers of members. Mm -hmm. And I would do, there are probably tenfold more folks who are connected to that committee rather than the four or five of us who are officially on that committee. And I want you to be part of that too. I want you to be, if you're willing to join us officially, uh, if you don't have that level of commitment, get plugged in with us anyway, be available to help, keep your eye open, be thinking with us about what we might do to broaden that conversation and to broaden that, that representation within the Library Association. Is there contact info on the NLA website for that or is it just reach out to you or how is? Um, you can certainly reach out to me. You can certainly go over to the Nebraska Library Association website and um, let folks know. You can reach out to um, the executive director. Ginger's really good about getting folks in touch who are interested. When you're renewing your membership, that's a great time to go in and express and reiterate your interest. Pick uh, what you're going to be part of, yeah. Was, um, they'll also let you express interest in committees, and that's a really good way to do it. But yeah, uh, my email is uh, tlentz at hastingslibrary.us. Email me, uh, email any of the other committee members that you already happen to know, uh, get in touch with us, and we'll talk about what we can do to get you plugged in. Yeah, good, yeah. All right, we do have a couple of uh, questions, or well, comments and whatnot here that have come in. Um, if anybody, we did just hit 11 o'clock, but that's okay. We'll keep going as long as people have questions, discussion, whatever. Um, if you do need to leave because you only allotted the hour for the show, that's fine. We are recording. You can always come back and watch what you didn't um, get to before. Um, uh, you can go ahead and keep your slides up there. Yeah, yeah, keep those up. Um, let's see, uh, someone did mention right as we were wrapping, you know, finishing talking about the cataloging that a good thing to look up on Twitter is the hashtag CritCat, C-R-I-T-C-A-T, for um, issues related to, uh, you know, cataloging. Yeah, Cat and, and CritLib, both of those hashtags will make you smarter. Yeah. Get you connected with people talking about it, yeah. And then we have a question. Um, Cassandra is from the Orange County Library System in Florida. Um, I was wondering the best way to ensure that titles you recommend are written by diverse authors and also and don't just contain diverse characters. And she says there's a hashtag own voices. Yes. I often find articles with lists, but they are often just the most popular titles. I work primarily with children and teens. So looking for the diverse authors as well as the content or in in addition to? I'm trying to think about how I've gotten into that um, 
it, it's been pretty intentional for my, again, science fiction reading to go find authors who are of diverse backgrounds. Um, there's some really great um, Chinese and Chinese American mm-hmm. sci fi going on, um, written by folks from those backgrounds. Um, obviously, so I mean, I guess like my approach has been I started with Octavia Butler and looked for anything that followed in her footsteps that got me to N.K. Jameson, that gets me to Nanetti Okorafor, um, that gets me to really a lot of folks out there, Tanana Riva Du. Um, start with start with one and then follow follow the thread in. That's kind of been my approach. Um, also though, there are a lot of things out there. Follow those hashtags, CritLib and CritCat. That's that's a great recommendation. Um, that's gonna get you out into um, some of those lists. Those lists are all floating around. I mean, you could probably go to the ALA website and start searching around and say, what's there? You could go to uh, School Library Journal for younger folks, Library Journal for general purpose and public library stuff. The lists are absolutely out there. Um, that's not been my own path in, but I know that it's accessible. Um, two librarians out there, start looking for those. And and I promise you it's out there and, and easily found. Yeah, and I just did a quick thing myself. Um, um, oh, wait, here's a suggestion. Oh yes, I've heard of this too. Um, someone else mentions the hashtag 1000 black girl books. So 1000 yes. black girl books is a great hashtag as well. Um, there's also, I just did a, just to be, you know, generic diverse authors as a, as a search and um found lots of lists lists out there about books by diverse authors that you should be want reading um and actually i'm going to find my right thing here bring up mine i'm going to do that screen there we go show my screen one. there we go and you know, I just did a very generic, but um, something that came up here. So the obviously lists that come up, but that I'd heard of. Um, where to go? We need diverse books. Nonprofit group. Which can you go on? There we go. And you, because you talked about being a children's and teen, this would be something definitely to look into where they're trying to change the publishing industry to have more of this. So this might be also a good place to go to um, to find more ideas and titles that same notion of a pipeline really applies i mean it's not our side but it's an adjacent industry i would really really like to see publishing start building their own pipelines so that you're not just talking about like diverse authors but you're talking about diverse editors you're talking about diverse agents you're talking about, across the line yep across the board yep. yeah who have the idea for like let's get disability lit because they already see it, you know, because they're already plugged into those communities. Let's get um, sex and gender diverse literature. Let's get racial and ethnically diverse literature. Let's get it again, de facto, not like, oh, we have this one book. Oh, I have this one friend, like mm-hmm. build an ecosystem around it. Mm-hmm. Just make it, it's a thing. It's, it is what it, it's. Yep. Kind of like you don't even think of it as something special. It's just the usual thing. You always make sure you have all of this. Yeah. Yeah. And like we're saying, representing your community too. You've probably got people of all these um, different ethnicities or religions or um, disabilities in your community. They're there somewhere. Um, Yep. And they are who you serve as a librarian, as as a community library. All right, any other last minute questions, comments, thoughts, desperate things that you want to share or um, ask? Uh, Any titles that you wanna throw out for people to read as well? Um, Oh, someone did just make another suggestion, diversebookfinder.org is a great source for picture books, has great categories. 
Um, maybe there's bookfinder.org. Let's see here. I do it. There it goes. Yep. Oh, nice. Black and Indigenous people. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is what's good too. I think here cataloged and analyzed picture books. That's the thing. You can find lists and things. And someone did mention, you know, they're just the most popular titles. That's what Cassandra said. Which yeah, everybody's. And now that these lists are coming out, and it's you know, here's the things you need to to read to be more diverse, to be an, you know, anti-racist reason. A lot of the same ones are getting repeated over and over again. Um, but it's good that you have someone that says, here's a deep dive into it. And we've actually analyzed and read all these books, not just grabbing all the same lists and, and repeating them again. And I like this going back since 2002. This is not new. <laughs> these books have been out there. There have been. It's just now. Yeah. So I'm taking notes on that. I wrote that down and I'm going to go play with that the next minute I have some free time yeah. is that I'm, I'm thank you to the person who passed that along to us okay. uh, but I really appreciate that all right mm -hmm. oh and here's some good comments coming through now yeah, absolutely uh Katie says and this is true too oh I mean, you did have, you know, that one about the uh, Astro Girl, but the comment is don't just read or recommend books about black pain, but also black joy. The, every book you read does not have to be about, you know, how everything, how everything bad that has happened. Black, indigenous, Native American, they all have great um, happy stories as well. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, and that is so, that is so, so important because, um, N.K. Jameson years ago had a uh, essay that she wrote that's turned into a little anthology and everything. Uh, How long till Black Futures Month? You know, we talk about Black history and it's this you know struggle and so on and so forth. And then you look at like science fiction and Star Trek has this one groundbreaking African American woman in it, but there's one. And you're like, well, so where do we go? You know, N. K. Jameson um, also then. Um, you know, writing the city we became, that is uh, that is a joyful book. Um, it's not, I mean, being a novel, there's there's struggle throughout it, but the joy in the diverse backgrounds that come together in that story is is readily apparent. And I, I just really want to like uh, shout out that comment because yes, like let's not just read, you know, like. Um, Oh, there's one I like, and I don't want to—I I don't want to disrespect it exactly. But like when I was a kid, I read *Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry*. I don't think that's an own voices book. Um, it's very good, but it's like you know African Americans in—I want to say like the Great Depression, but like struggling. And I'm like, good, good, good. Again, don't stop there, um, and don't only talk about the struggles, don't only talk about like how hard it is to be an immigrant in this country, uh, how hard it is. Um, you know, they talk about this in movies, but like, don't make the uh, sex and gender diverse issue or characters, your tragic friend who dies midway through the story all the time. Like, let them, let them be the hero. You know, let them be uh, the main characters in the love story. Let's really normalize and recognize and acknowledge and, and highlight all of our diverse characters. Uh, and we have a couple other suggestions for books, um, good titles um, that have, um, oh, graphic novels that have LGBTQ themes. Uh, Flamer by Mike Carrado, Carrado, and The Magic Fish by Trung Lenegain. Uh, I'm not sure how to, yeah, are uh, both um, graphic novels. So Flamer and the Magic Fish under graphic novels are things that you could find as well. And I think that's good too. You, were, you had shown that other graphic novel of the Octavia Butler. That's always something too to get some people, especially your, um, you know, it's stereotypical, but I love graphic novels and comics. I'm a big comic book reader. And that sometimes has gotten me into reading um, the novel after I've read the graphic novel, <laughs> depending yep. on the 
hard it is and deep you know the story is. Um, I also sometimes follow up after I've read a novel. I want to see another representation of it and read the graphic novel as well. I was talking with a couple of high school kids who had to read. Uh, I forget what it was, but it was some classic. And so I want to say Beowulf. I think Beowulf has been adapted into a graphic novel. Probably sure, yeah. And so I said, make sure you read actual Beowulf to get the language right. But before that, grab the graphic novel, know the story. Then when you have to go back and plow through what your English teacher wants you to read, um, you know, don't cliff notes it, but it gives you the story before you have to plow through the language. Mm -hmm. And that same principle applies when you're reading diversely. Like if you jump in and you grab Kindred or if you grab uh, the adaptations of Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents before you read Octavia Butler, I mean, she's pretty readable, but she's not exactly the thing I'm talking about here. But man, that's a great way to start. You know, read it as a graphic novel first and, and let that be. I mean, whatever gets you reading, if that's how you read diversely, do it. Yeah. It's not about the container, it's about what you're, the content. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, it doesn't look like anybody else has uh, got anything else they want to add. If you do have anything else, go ahead and get it in. Um, any last words, Tim, besides read diversely and join the NLA's diversity committee? <laughs> uh, no, that probably sums it up right there. And, and remember that it is right here, it is in your community. Um, it, it's already there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make sure you're paying attention and, and doing the work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. So I think we'll wrap it up for today's show. Um, thank you everyone for attending. This was a great discussion, great um, tips and, and um, chat from everyone. And thank you so much, Tim, for being here. You did fine doing this all on your own. Not a problem, of course. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to your other committee members too for um, all their work on this um, as well. Yes, absolutely. I want to I want to shout out the committee members for for getting me here. I mean, I'm the face of it just this morning, but um, this doesn't happen without them. Yeah. Awesome. So um, that'll wrap it up for today's show. I'm gonna go back to our page here. Um, as I said, it has been recorded and will be posted to our archives. Um, I should have it um, all edited and ready to go before the end of the week, by, um, um, before the end of this week. Um, our archives are right here underneath our upcoming shows. You can click on there and uh, the most recent one will be at the top of the page. Um, so this is the one from just last week, our um, regular monthly pretty sweet tech from our technology innovation librarian. We'll have a link to recording on our YouTube channel and a link to, in this case, she had a guide, but a link to uh, the slides. Uh, Tim did, did send me his slides. We'll have those as well. Um, everyone who attended this morning and registered for today's show will receive an email directly from me letting you know when recording is ready. Um, we'll also um, push it out on our social media everywhere. Uh, we use the NCUMP Live as an abbreviation for Encompass Live on our Twitter and uh, Instagram and, and Facebook and anywhere else we push it out there. We'll announce that as well. Um, I'll also show you here, we do have links to, we do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. So if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there and you'll get notified of when we have upcoming shows. Just a reminder to log into today's show our presenter etc cetera, etc cetera. um last week's show so if you do like to follow um things on, on facebook you can follow us there um, i'll also mention in our archives we do have a search feature so if you want to search through our archives and find out um any other if we had any other topics of interest that you might be wanting to watch on here um, you can search our whole archives or you can limit it to the most recent 12 months if you want to just have recent um shows. Uh, this is because this is the full archives from Encompass, of Encompass Live. I'm going to scroll down a bit here. I'm not going to go all the way to the bottom because it's a huge long list. This goes back to the very beginning of Encompass Live. Encompass Live premiered in January 2009. So we've got over 10 years worth of recordings here. Uh, so um, just pay attention when you are watching a show uh, to the original broadcast date. They're all dated, so you know when they first were, were done. So you can see, you know, some of these shows will stand the test of time, reading lists and whatnot. But um, things like this, the solar eclipse from 2017, might be interesting to watch, but it's not going to help you do something <laughs> this week, um, this year. 
um, but just um, pay attention there. And um, we will always keep our full archives up here. You know, we are librarians, this is what we do. We keep things for historical purposes. We um, archive and so we will always keep them here as long as the internet and YouTube are, are there for us. So that will wrap up for today's show. Um, I hope you join us in, and we've got our upcoming shows here. I'm working on getting a couple more December dates and January dates confirmed, so keep an eye on our schedule. But next week we'll be talking about esports, something else near and dear to my heart, um, video gaming. <laughs> uh, esports and evidence-based connected learning. Um, esports competition tournaments, uh, video games, and um, how you can use this in, uh, there's actually the North America Scholastic Esports Federation. We're gonna have some people talking about that next week. So please do uh, register for that and any of our other upcoming shows. So thank you everyone for attending and hopefully we'll see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>